Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another compilation, and we're going to hear more amazing stories from you viewers. But we have a little bit of follow-up from a previous episode. So Sinus Directus previously pointed out that if the left one is a tertiary alcohol, which one of these should be the tertiary amine? And we have an interesting comment from another viewer that says, uh, I like the argument of terbutanol makes terbutalamine a tertiary amine, but on the contrary, if triethylamine is a tertiary amine, does this make dimethyl ether a secondary alcohol? And so here's our secondary amine, here's our tertiary amine, here's our primary alcohol, Therefore, by that logic, dimethyl ether would be a secondary alcohol. So we definitely have some work to do because our nomenclature definitely is not that sound. What do you think? Let me know down below. Technically not research, but by far my favorite lab story is from OCHEM 1 as an undergraduate TA at a small teaching university. We are so small that we usually only graduate approximately 15 chemistry and biochem majors per year, and 10 to 15 of those are pre-med students, so it's safe to say that there weren't any chem nerds in the class. This was their first time using actual glassware, with ground glass joints, and they were doing a classic fractional distillation with 1922 kits and steel wool packing. I was just doing my thing. No, the still head goes at the other end of the condenser. I believe you're looking for a round bottom flask. The classic, that's called a Klyacin adapter. So basically what they're doing here is they're just pointing out to students, this is what this piece of glassware is for, this is how you use it, etc. Actual quotes. I noticed a student having a particularly rough go of it and decided to give them a hand. As I picked up one of the pieces of glassware, I immediately noticed that it was sticky. That is never a good sign if you're handling glassware. Clearly the last person to use this kit failed to properly clean off the grease, or one of them, let me just finger paint grease people. So sometimes when people are putting grease on a joints, what you'll do is you'll put it onto like a finger of your glove, glove and apply it to the inside of the joint or the outside of the joint. More commonly, you apply it to the, the male joint. And uh, then as you apply the two pieces of glassware together, it spreads into the female joint. And so sometimes people don't change their gloves. And so what happens is they get grease over absolutely everything. And so this is what um, Christian Wenzel here is uh, expecting happen. So I go wash my hands, grab some gloves, and a wash bottle of hexane. Hexane is a really good way to get rid of grease because grease is essentially just hydrocarbon, and so hexane is a really good solvent to get rid of it. Usually if you get hexane on a little bit of paper towel or some other thing you can wipe with, it does a pretty good job of removing grease. And a big wad of paper towels before getting any uh, before getting to the work to clean up this greasy mess. Once I get that cleaned up, I pick up the column, and that's greasy too. So I start cleaning that. Clearly the last person to use this kit was an absolute slob. It's at this moment that the student goes, hey, um, I think we need some more of that grease stuff. Um, what? I had to put out a standard tube of Dow Corning high vacuum grease. Everybody has one of these tubes. It's like a turquoise blue tube, and this is the most common grease I've ever seen in any lab. I don't think I've seen a chem lab that doesn't have one kicking around somewhere, usually with a cracked lid. Admittedly, it was only about a quarter full, but like I said, we are a small university. Those tubes usually last us one to two years. And in my experience, it's similar. Those things usually last several years. At this point, I looked over at the student and watched as they pick up the column that I just finished cleaning for them and start to massage this poor thing. At first, I thought it was some sort of weird sexual joke or something, but no one was laughing. I simply asked them what they're doing, and they respond, well, you said that we were supposed to grease them. Finally, it all clicks, and I pick up the condenser to confirm. They painted this poor thing with grease, the joints, not the whole damn thing. To which they respond with the absolute favorite quote, Oh no, I forgot about those. And they quickly rub grease on the joints. So they covered every inch of the glassware, uh, except for the joints. That is hilarious. Outside of the jacket? Covered. Outside of the taper? Covered. Those hose barbs where the vacuum's taking off? Like, like when you're putting it on a vacuum adapter and the condenser? Those caked with grease, and I don't think that hose could have stayed on any of them. Yeah, if you've ever put grease uh, on an adapter for tubing before, it absolutely just slides right off. Um, the mating surface of the joints? Now, nah, why? Why would anyone ever do that? Yeah, this is probably my favorite story in today's episode. Pretty tame story compared to everything else, but once I had a geology lab where we had to identify a bunch of rocks. One test was to lick the rock to figure out if it was sodium chloride. One other test was to dip dilute hydrochloric acid to see if it contained carbonates. Suffice to say, I now know what dilute hydrochloric acid tastes like. Now, if you're anything like me, you might have a little bit of a bias against the geologists, but here we have a story confirming they are literally rock lickers. If you disagree, let me know down below. So yeah. My sodium cre oxide accident. Fairly long, but gold. First thing you should know, I got into chemistry because I used to collect chemical warfare gear, like gas masks, uh, etc. One day, I got a Polish Communist Army IPP-51M chemical decontamination kit. It contains four ampules. 
1.3% sodium presoxide and ethanol used for getting rid of nerve gas from the chemical suit and guns by soaking a cotton ball and wiping it off. Two, isopentyl nitrite ampules used as an antidote for cyanide and phosgene. You break off the end and sniff the vapor. Three, zinc chloride solution with another ampule inside containing chloramine B used for neutralizing mustard gas and leucite, so-called blister gases. The ampule three came already broken. Luckily, only the outer zinc chloride. Washed it, cleaned, and done. A few months later, when I checked it, the plastic sodium presoxide ampule was leaking through the piece, where two plastic parts were heated shut. So for safety, I decided to just pour it down the drain, stupid me. I decided to put these big chemical warfare rated gloves and my only prescription glasses, stupid me. I decided to squeeze it out of that crack it was leaking from. Well, I squeezed too hard and the ampule popped and splashed sodium presoxide all over me and my kitchen. Friendly reminder, this is about 50 milliliters of 30% sodium presoxide in ethanol. I got it onto my shirt, legs, even behind my glasses. Luckily, it didn't hit my eyes, only near my right eye. I quickly ran to the bathroom, washed myself thoroughly, and changed clothes, grabbed my MSA gas mask, and began to decontaminate. I have to tell you, the sodium presoxide is the total definition of chemical smell. It looks and smells like total cancer and death. It isn't very pleasant, but it hits you with that, I'm very toxic vibe. The smell was so strong that it covered uh, any smell of the solvent, and I wasn't even able to smell the ethanol. In terms of looks, it's an extremely dark liquid. You see it, you smell it, and you know you have to get rid of it as soon as possible. I washed down the entire kitchen with water, even though it's a base, treating it with an acid like vinegar would have been a terrible idea, as cresol would form, which is even more toxic. The smell lasted five months. I don't know if I'm going to get lung cancer or what, but I now know I have a small burn in a place near my eye where I got hit with the crease oxide. The moral of the story, always wear goggles and don't squeeze old, leaking, toxic, and corrosive chemical ampules. Peace. Yeah, I've smelled cresols before and they don't smell particularly good and phenols are often quite toxic. Uh, in fact, the parent compound phenol is actually used to kill nail bed of uh, nails. So if you go to the doctor and you have like a hangnail and you keep getting hangnails on the same toe or finger, the doctor is actually able to apply a little bit of a phenol solution and that'll kill the nail bed. So yeah, phenols uh, can be quite toxic. And I don't know whether the protonated or the deprotonated form would be better, uh, but uh, they're both still bad. So you definitely want to avoid getting anything like that on your skin. And I don't know why you'd be buying old uh, war chemicals, I probably wouldn't recommend you do that, but, um, you know, do what you're going to do. College accident. During a lab exercise that used halogenated organics, we were told to weigh out a small quantity of methyl iodide. However, the gloves we were given were not rated for stopping diffusion of methyl iodide through the skin. Students who came into contact with any iodomethane developed chemical burns on their hands several hours later. The boils which formed were full of clear fluid, which was yellow in color. That's terrifying. I I cannot imagine getting iodomethane in contact with my skin. And like, iodomethane is pretty terrifying. We actually had a pretty terrifying story involving iodomethane recently uh, in a different Discord, but I don't think I could talk about that on the channel. Uh, definitely be safe if you're working with iodomethane and treat it if it's carcinogen as if it's carcinogenic because it's a methylating agent. And things that are methylating agents are usually fairly carcinogenic, and it's believed that iodomethane is a carcinogen. Before, let me make it clear that I am not a professional chemist. I am a home chemist. So the story is, the ammonium bicarbonate I had bought arrived a few days prior. I had bought three kilograms to make sure that it didn't end, so that they didn't run out of it. The reason that I bought more of the ammonium carbonate was to make concentrated ammonia solution. So basically, if they just heat up the ammonium bicarbonate, it should just make ammonia and CO2 and water. So I decided to do that. I I've taken what I need, mixed the dry ammonium bicarbonate beforehand, thinking I was a genius or something. I added it in, and then I added about 5 to 10 mils of water just to get things going. So what's happening as they add a base here is it's deprotonating the ammonium, and it's making free ammonia. And so presumably they're trying to like distill the ammonia over and then add that to a solution of water, and th so that way they get um, ammonium hydroxide. It did work for a few seconds, but it stopped, and I thought that it just needed more water, but nothing. I tried adding concentrated NaOH solution, but it didn't work. Then I had the amazingly stupid idea of adding solid sodium hydroxide. Well, it worked, but it worked too well. It foamed up a lot, pressure built up, and I think some of the sodium hydroxide crystal mixture uh, of sodium and ammonium bicarbonate made it clog. And here comes the how I learned that PPE is really important. I wasn't wearing any safety glasses. I know that I'm dumb. I should have been wearing them. And in the end, I learned up. I ended up learning the hard way that um, you need to wear PPE. Since the hose was clogged and pressure built up, the hose popped off and in the process, it sprayed my eyes with ammonium bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate, and NaOH. Yikes. 
I was probably really lucky because I wasn't doing it in my regular chemistry area, which is closed and not near any sink. I was doing it outside, right next to a sink. I was there because of the smell of ammonia, which I hate, and the idea of ammonia building up in the room wasn't appealing to me, both because of the fear of its toxicity and the smell, so I was able to wash my eyes quickly, which probably saved me from some bad eye damage. Since it was a sink, I couldn't wash both eyes evenly though, even though I tried my best. So the vision in one of my eyes was blurry for two days, and my eyes hurt from practically anything, including light for two days too, and for some more time, which I believe was, again, two days. So if I touched my closed eyes, it still hurt. Today, nearly a week later, I am fine, and I have learned my lesson very well. That is terrifying. You do not want to get chemicals in your eyes ever, and you should always wear lab glasses or lab goggles to protect yourself. Uh, I included this story specifically to make sure that if you're doing any home chemistry, that you're being as safe as possible. And as I said in a previous episode, always have a fire extinguisher. In this case, there is no fire, but in many cases, there could be. And one little fire caused by one stupid accident can cause millions of dollars in damage. So make sure you have appropriate PPE and make sure you have ways to stop fires if they start. One of the best stories that I have heard from my labs, a guy is making an analytical chem project, something like zinc quantification in hair. So he samples one hair from his head, uh, which is uh, high in zinc because he dyes it a lot, and one from his under parts as a reference. Then everybody has to do a presentation on their projects. So he shares a photo of his hair and the parts where he got it with the whole class, two teachers and one guest. The incident got named the swallow nest because when one of the teachers got asked about the incident, she answered, you couldn't even see much. It was like a swallow nest. Oh, I love this story so much. Oh no, all the stories are coming back. I had a natural product isolation in my undergrad. I think I had a 10 liter round bottom flask with a wheat bran and was adding sulfuric acid. They were trying to make uh, a very a specific chemical. Anyway, the reaction went fine, but a 10 liter RBF is probably one of the worst vessels to clean tar out of. I had concentrated NaOH solution in it already and then added the Trio Infernal, which is just HCl, H2SO4, and HNO3, which is hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid, mixed together and added it. I don't know why. I thought that the heat of the neutralization would help. I don't know, man, but I'm sure you understand laser and chlorine gas. Yeah, you know, you figure hotter, more vigorous, maybe stuff will happen. We're trying to get stuff to happen, so maybe I can I can understand where you're coming from. Anyway, there is a loud thump sound, and a lot of ammonium chloride is formed which to the people who didn't know is a very fine powder. So the RBF was completely foggy and there was fog all over the hood. I pulled down the sash right when the TA walked by and asked what's going on here and I said nothing and he was somehow satisfied with that answer and just walked past. On another occasion, I was cleaning up an azide SN2 reaction with a phase transfer catalyst. I rinsed everything twice with bicarbonate in the hood and I brought it out to be rinsed with water. But then two rinses were clearly not enough. Within seconds, I felt my heart raising and everything started turning dark. So I put the vessel and reflux condenser in the hood, took off my gloves and got into the lounge and contemplated my life decisions. Yeah, if you're ever feeling like a chemical is affecting you and you aren't sure if you're gonna go unconscious or something, definitely give yourself space because it's better to like be wrong about that and actually you're fine than to be wrong about that and actually, you know, crap is hitting the fan and this could be it for you. and. Sometimes when an accident like this happens, sometimes several people can be affected. So if it's toxic enough to affect you, even if you're doing chemistry in a hood, sometimes other people can be negatively affected. So you always should be careful. I have another one for you. In my first semester of university, I was in an inorganic lab. To my defense, I had no clue about chemistry at this point. In the lab, there was a re weekly rotating lab job, including cleaning up the lab after it is finished. At some point, I had to do the lab cleaning. I was running around the lab with paper towels and acetone, wiping up all of the working spaces from other students. One working space was hilariously stained orange. I didn't spend a second thinking about it and just wiped everything off like I did before. So I want to just put a pin in this. If you are ever in a lab at all, you should be wearing gloves. And if your lab doesn't have that protocol, that's probably wrong. You might say, well, most stuff is relatively fine. Do you know what's more relatively fine? Wearing gloves. After I was done cleaning, I asked a PhD student who was supervising uh, what the orange stuff might be. He answered that it was probably potassium dichromate. I didn't know anything about chromates since I was slightly behind with my experiments, so I asked him if the stuff was concerning. He looked me dead serious in the eyes and said, it's highly toxic and carcinogenic. Guess who didn't wear gloves wiping that stuff up? I washed my hands for at least 10 minutes trying to get rid of the orange stain on my skin. Yeah, chromium salts are no joke. They're really toxic, and you should definitely be careful if you're ever working with them. 
I tried home chem once, just after graduating high school. I had a good relationship with my former high school chem teacher. I decided to synthesize Prussian blue for purposes of cyanotyping. And if you aren't familiar with cyanotyping, Niall Red has a really good video on this, and I'll include a link to it here. Potassium dichromate is frequently used to extend the shelf life, so I got some concentrated stuff from the school with permission from the chemistry teacher. A week later, I am preparing the dichromate, and in my infinite wisdom, I decided to not wear safety glasses because I was just making a solution. While stirring, I bumped the beaker and the dichromate solution splashed onto my face, including my eyes, so I began washing my eyes and call my mum to take me to the hospital, where I spent the next four hours with my eyes being washed with a hose, whose outlet was attached directly to my eyes. I then see an optometrist at the hospital, where they put some form of stain to assess the damage. There was damage. Many, many sessions with said doctor later, over the next few months, were used to assess the healing process. So now I have permanent damage in my left eye from chemical burns because of my own negligence eight years ago. And so this is an important thing to highlight that it's not just research chemicals that are dangerous. There's chemicals that normal people can get access to, whether it's through their high school lab or something else that could you know, cause damage for the rest of your life. So you should definitely be careful if you're ever working with any chemicals and always, always, always wear appropriate PPE. In my high school, where my chemistry teacher did the old sulfuric acid and sugar trick, um, he didn't find an old beaker and chose to use an Erlenmeyer flask instead. And so one thing to think about here is when you have a beaker, it's got ni a nice uniform width, and so if gas is generated, it just goes straight up. However, if you've ever seen the elephant's toothpaste experiment, when you have an Erlenmeyer, it's getting narrower and narrower, and so the pressure will build up as the volume of the stuff moves up the Erlenmeyer. And so this is what's happening here. As you probably already predicted, the neck got clogged with carbon sugar acid slurry and promptly exploded and showered the entire class in glass and acid, ruining some articles of clothing, and fortunately nothing more. Yeah, sulfuric acid is no joke, so uh, it's fortunate that nobody was harmed in this instance. In my first semester in organic lab, I managed to knock over a 50 ml bottle of mercury nitrate solution or some other salt, which dumped about half of its contents all over my hand. I immediately ran to the sink and washed my hands for the next 10 minutes. I called my supervisor and he said I should be fine. Inorganic mercury salts aren't in crazy dangerous on skin contact alone. Still, this was without doubt the most scared I've been in my entire life career. This is the worst part of the story, okay? P.S. I should mention that because this, the biggest and most expensive lab course and the uni apparently didn't want to pay for utensils. The students were instructed to buy their own gloves at the supply shop. Now you can imagine, we were lenient in their use. Not a single week passed without me returning home with yellow fingers from some concentrated nitric acid splashes. Ran out of shop towel? Your lab coat sleeve will do. Good times. Yeah, this is a really terrible system. Uh, you should always supply gloves to the students, because if you're going to incentivize them to not use gloves, surprise, they won't use gloves. The embarrassment of chucking a faming flaming rat at your department head reminded me of a story I heard from a glassblower at Washington State University. Supposedly, an organic group was scaling up a new synthesis and had just taken delivery of a new 72-liter flask. The grad student who was unboxing this beach ball-sized flask fumbled it, and the flask bounced on the floor, and he caught it on the rebound. So he was so astonished that he went over to his advisor's office and said, watch this, as he failed to bounce the flask a second time. Now, I've got lucky a few times with glassware where it bounces and it doesn't break, but uh, one time I tested my luck with a 1 or 2 liter round bottom flask, and that thing absolutely shattered. And so did my happiness. I have three stories as well. When I was in seventh grade, our substitute chemistry teacher thought it was a fun idea to make butyric acid from rancid butter, ethanol, and NaOH. The past me was amazed at how bad it reeked, and I convinced the teacher to let me take some of the sample home, probably just a few milliliters inside of a test tube. I wasn't stupid, or at least I thought so, so I'd stopped at the test tube and put it inside three layers of tied up plastic bags I got from sandwiches that my mom made for school. I took the sample home, but my parents wouldn't allow me to store the sample anywhere inside our house, so I stored it in a shed outside of our house. I don't remember what happened to the sample after this. However, the next morning I realized that my backpack smelled like a sweaty hobo had used it to collect his vomit for weeks on end. Um, I'm, he's guessing here that he's just been blind to the smell, because sometimes when you're working with strong smells, you just get used to it, and you can't tell how bad it is anymore. From that point on, I was known in school as the guy with the smelly backpack. I had to use that backpack for three more years, and the smell never went away. Also, all of my school books reeked of butyric acid, and I had to give them to the next generation of pupils after that year, so my legacy didn't end there. 
yes, I would say most chemistry labs have some smell of butyric acid if butyric acid has ever been used in it. And I can also confirm that even my lab notebooks from uh, labs where I've worked with butyric acid still have a slight smell of butyric acid to this day. During my bachelor's in science in chemistry, we had inorganic qualitative analysis lab. So we got a vial of mixed ingredients and had to find out which cations and anions were contained. Unlike medicine and geoscience majors, which had to do the lab together with us chemists, the chemist samples could contain everything, while the medicine and geoscience majors only had harmless stuff in their samples. I happen to have arsenic and cadmium salts, besides other salts. Yeah, that's pretty scary. Since there were way too many people in the lab, we had to share a fume hood with six other people to do the experiments, but we still had to get our stuff done in time. No need to say it was pretty messy, and the room had to be cleared due to hydrogen sulfide alarms going off several times due to a contamination of thioacetamide in the glassware. A few weeks after the lab and cleaning the fume hood, I got a twitch in one of my eyebrows, which went away after two to three months. Pretty sure I poisoned myself with heavy metals during that lab. Yeah, I really hope you didn't, because that's absolutely terrifying. Now, this is my favorite story for this whole episode. I'm currently doing my master's in science in geosciences, and we were having to dissolve rock samples in 40% HF to free the contained cuticles and pollen slash spores. From the beginning on, we were told horror stories about it and how dangerous it is. They're talking about the HF here. So none of my master's students and bachelor's students colleagues were keen about working with it. I, on the other hand, didn't mind as I had a bachelor's in science and chemistry before, and I had respect and wasn't afraid if I was using the proper safety measures. Once my professor gave a lecture about the preparation of cuticle samples, and he told us about an Eastern European postdoc who had worked in our facility for a short time. He told us that this guy used his bare fingers to stir 40% HF rock sample solutions and quickly and thoroughly wash his hands right after. The guy was fine and nothing bad did happen to him as far as I know. He knew it wouldn't be reabsorbed into his skin that fast, but I, I would still never do that. Yeah, I would never do that either. What the heck? That's terrifying. Why would you stir HF with bare fingers? That's so stupid. Ah, this reminds me of a story about a biochemistry student that's still told to this year. Every year, they have an ion lottery lab course, uh, which is shorter than the typical chemistry bachelor's program, but it's still something, where you have to do qualitative analysis on some unknown inorganic salts. Well, one student goes to the assistant and tells them, well, according to all the tests I've done, this should be sodium chloride. And the assistant goes, yeah, and what about it? The answer was something along the lines of, well, it doesn't taste like it. Yeah, you should not be tasting your salts to see whether or not they're the things you think they are. That is a terrible idea. Uh, that student is lucky that they didn't get like disciplined for that. Watching slash listening to some of these, especially the garlic distillation, gave me a great laugh and a couple reminded me of my tour in Iraq in 2003. Firstly, I am not a chemist in any way, shape, or form. Secondly, I had a complete anthrax vaccine series prior to this incident, so I knew it wasn't anthrax. While cleaning up a building roughly 10 miles from Baghdad, my section chief and I both started having reactions to a chemical powder that was scattered across one of the rooms. For me, the reaction was close to CS gas, to which I have an allergy, but not as major. I asked if we should mask up. But he said no, as it was fine, and he wasn't feeling any effects from it. We get the room cleaned out, and I take our samples and to our person, and he had no idea what it was either, and he decontaminated the room. Now, my former section chief still has a cough to this day, and he cannot get rid of it, and I have issues with my sinuses, plus an occasional cough. Still have no idea what it was we were exposed to, and it will be 20 years next summer. Yeah, it absolutely terrifies me that non-experts are dealing with potentially hazardous chemicals, and it's surprising to me that there wasn't better training from the military for you in this case. That's awful, and I'm so sorry to hear about that. So back in high school, I worked for a pool maintenance service, and many of the pools had automatic chlorinators, basically a pipe that you'd fill with tablets, with a metered flow of water through them. Well, one time I opened up to refill it, and it looks like the plastic inside had been stained a deep yellow. I was wrong. The plastic was still white, and that was chlorine gas. I felt like I was coughing my lungs up. Yeah, that's terrifying. Be careful with bleach. It's no joke. So I just want to say briefly that, again, there's very many comments for this episode, and I still have at least 50 really good stories that you guys will get to see in future videos. And I'm planning to start doing these more frequently, so make sure you do comment down below with your great stories. I read every comment still on the channel, and I probably have to spend two or three hours a day reading comments because you guys have so many great, amazing stories. So with that, I'd like to thank you for watching. It would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed. And I hope you have a great day. Now I want to see if you can make a potent tear gas by extracting essential oils from onions. When life gives you onions, make onionade.